Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be able to uh, join you once again as uh, you worship God in your homes. Before we uh, commence our, our service of worship, um, let me begin with some uh, announcements. Uh, the first of which is, well, let me say uh, a big thank you to all of uh, you who sent in photos and videos introducing yourself. Uh, it's really helpful to me. And uh, well, hopefully if you did that, you received um, a video, the video that Emma and Ben put together. Uh, if you didn't, if I missed that, then, then let me know. Um, they, would love to, they would love to send that to you again. The other thing I want to announce or say at the very beginning is that some of you um, are aware of, will have noticed uh, in the news, uh, the executive uh, of, uh, of the assembly um, uh, have allowed or allowing uh, our church buildings uh, to be reopened. Um, in response to this news, uh, the session met this last week and we have uh, we've asked a group of people uh, to come together, a task group, uh, to investigate this and to see when uh, it might be possible and sensible for us to open up again. Uh, let me say um, on that that it's, it's, it's unlikely that this is going to happen before the end of the summer. Certainly uh, it won't happen in July. We won't be back in July. And um, the other thing to say is that when we go back to using our church buildings and using them first and foremost for Sunday worship, um, it's unlikely that it's going to be the end of these recorded services. Um, so don't worry if you hear news that or you think that we're going to open our church building and that means you're going to have to go. Um, that's not going to be the case. Um, I imagine we'll be running um, both simultaneously for, for some time. Uh, let me, uh, can I ask you that um, if you have any concerns or questions about this, we would love your, your input. And uh, hopefully you know who your elder is and you can speak uh, to him. Uh, if not, of course, you're more than welcome uh, to speak to me. Um, on that, the, the, the number for the months that you might have uh, isn't currently working. We're having a little bit of an issue uh, with BT. Um, they're struggling to come here with the, the restrictions. But my mobile number is on the uh, church website and I encourage you to use that. Let me say, can I ask also that you would be praying uh, for us for wisdom? We're going to be doing that later in our service, but we could be praying for us for wisdom as we um, seek to, to, to seek to find God's will uh, in this uh, in terms of opening up our buildings. It's not something we want to do um, quickly or well, we do want to do it quickly, but we don't want to do it unwisely. So can I invite you to, to pray with us? as we seek how to do that well and in accordance with God's word. And I think that is uh, all my announcements. So let's take a second and settle our hearts um, as we prepare to be called into God's presence. Well, let's begin our service of worship. And we begin our service of worship by coming into God's presence. And we enter his presence by hearing and responding to his call. And this is his call to worship. It comes from Psalm 20. Let me read to you God's word. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall but we rise and stand. This morning we are invited, we're called by God to stand in his presence. And we're able to stand before him because of Jesus Christ. It is through his death and resurrection that the way to God has been opened. And now by his spirit, we can not only know God, but we can worship him. We're going to respond to this great act, this great gospel in prayer. So let us bow our heads together and let's pray. Almighty God, how wonderful it is to be able to stand in your presence. You are holy, holy, holy. And we are a people of unclean lips. Yet we praise you this morning because you have made a way whereby our relationship with you has been restored and we can now fulfill our created purpose and give you the praise, the honour and the glory that you deserve. Almighty God, we thank you that your son, Jesus Christ, 
came into this world to defeat evil and deliver his people from their sins. We thank you that, well, as we are going to read later in our service, we thank you that although it seemed that he, his ministry was a great success, that he had drawn the popularity of the masses, that he did not waver from his mission. We thank you that he was not, never distracted by fame or by popularity. We thank you that he was not put off by those who opposed his authority. And we thank you that he did not succumb to temptation. Rather, we praise you, Jesus. We praise you for your devotion. A devotion that, that led you straight to a Roman cross, where you bore the Father's righteous wrath and paid for the sins of your people. Almighty God, we know that as we believe in him, a faith that is a gift from you, that rather than offering you our filthy rags, which we are, we are, can only do on our own, Heavenly Father, you have robed us with righteous robes. You have given us a crown and you have made us your children. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But as we recall it in your presence, as we stand before you, knowing and recognising what you have done, we also recognise that we are sinful people. We know that Jesus, we're going to see this in our passage, that Jesus calls those who are not worthy, who are not qualified to stand before a holy God. But yet our sin deceives us. Our sinful nature has us deceiving ourselves into thinking that we are worthy. We think that Jesus saved us because perhaps we're not that bad or perhaps because of our Christian heritage or perhaps because of our good works. Will we pray to you this morning, Heavenly Father, that you, by your Spirit, would remind us of our depravity, that every element of our being is completely sinful and that without your aid, we can do no good thing. Remind us that without your spirit, we would be dead in our sins and our trespasses and that we would not be able to speak to you or know you without his work. Forgive us to you whenever we forget or, or doubt Jesus' care for us. When we sin again and again and again, as we're so, we're so inclined to do, Remind us of how great his love is for his people. Know that it never wanes, it never diminishes. And that even though we are unfaithful, even though we rebel against him, his care for us is unlimited. Jesus, we praise you for who you are and what you have done for us. And we thank you that you, you have enabled us to, to know God on high, stand before his great throne. And we thank you too that you have enabled us to repent our sins to you. And so we pray that you would help us do that. Help us continue to be a repentant people so that we might grow closer to you and we might be transformed even more into your likeness. Amen. Well, we have just repented our sins to our Heavenly Father. So let us now hear his words of pardon, an assurance of pardon, from Isaiah 44. This is what God has to say to his people. He says, I have wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud and your sins like a heavy mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. We praise God, don't we, for these words, these words of assurance that he loves us, that he has redeemed us. And so in response to his word, we're going to sing to him, sing words of praise. So let's do that as the musicians commence. Uh, let us follow the words to Worthy as the Lamb and sing praise to our Almighty God.
as we turn now to the second part of our service, uh, can I invite you to, to grab a Bible and to turn with me for, to our passage for today. Um, we're going to be continuing our series in Mark and we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 1 uh, verses 16 uh, to 39. So let's turn there together, shall we? Mark chapter 1 verses 16 to 39. Commencing at verse 16. This is God's word. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he, that is Jesus, saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in the boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her. And she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And when he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, and casting out demons. Amen. I want to encourage you to, to keep your Bibles open in front of you um, as we're going to be studying it together. But before we do, um, let us turn to God and ask him for his help in, uh, in studying it together. So let us pray. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that through it we can learn more about your son, Jesus Christ, and that by coming to know him, we can learn more about his gospel. We pray for us today as we study this large passage of scripture, but we pray that its meaning would become clear to us and that we would see what your gospel writer Mark wants us to know about Jesus. We pray also for your, the help of your Holy Spirit, that he will enable us not only to understand what is saying, but that he would help us heed it and that through coming to your word, that he would transform our lives. Amen. Amen. Well, last week we started our series in Mark's Gospel by familiarising ourselves with Mark's purpose for writing. If you're with us, you'll remember that Mark showed us that his Gospel um, was all or is all about Jesus' identity. He's the Christ. He's the Son of God. But as well as it being about Jesus' identity, Mark showed us that it's all about Jesus' 
purpose. Jesus came into the world to defeat evil and to save his people from their sins. Well, today we have the first act of Mark's gospel account. The curtain is about to be drawn. Uh, we're about to meet the characters for the first time. And best of all, we have front row seats. And as we watch the drama unfold over these next few episodes, over this first act, I think we're going to be surprised. For as we look from our privileged position, we're going to see that Jesus is not what we expect. And that's what we're seeing today. Jesus is an unexpected Christ. He's not what we expect. Now to help us see this, I'm going to divide our passage into four points. Um, we're going to see that he is a Christ who calls, a Christ who challenges, a Christ who cares, and a Christ with clarity. I don't worry if you're taking notes and you didn't get those. I'll, I'll be saying those throughout the sermon. But let's get into this passage because we have a, a lot to get through and see our very first point. We need to see, or we're going to see, that Jesus is a Christ who calls. Now, uh, we see this, or what we're going to see in this point is that those whom Jesus calls are unexpected. They're not who we might expect. And we see this, uh, if you look down at your Bibles, from verses 16 to 20. And you look there, you can remind yourself what happened in those verses. Jesus calls four fishermen. He calls Simon and Andrew and James and John. Now, without being too unkind to these men, especially as it was clear that they were fairly successful, we can see that in verse 20, where it tells us that they had servants. But without being too unkind to these men, if we remember what we saw last week, we realise that these are perhaps not who we would expect Jesus to call. Remember, who? Um, what did we learn last week? Remember, we saw that the three steps affirming Jesus' identity as both the promised King of Israel and as the Son of God. And we also heard Mark make this remarkable claim that Jesus, Jesus was going to be the one who would defeat evil and deliver God's people from their sins. And so, as we look down at these verses 16 to 20, we have to ask ourselves, why is Jesus starting his ministry? Why is the very opening, uh, opening scene of the first act at the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus is with some very ordinary men who are doing very ordinary things? We think about that for a minute, we realise that it is unexpected, isn't it? Let's think about this a little bit further, shall we? I, I don't know if you have ever seen The West Wing. It's a, a TV programme um, about the presidency of the United States. Um, it's one of Mel and I, it's one of our favourites, and it's absolutely brilliant. But something that, come across, something that comes across very clearly in that TV programme is that there is no one quite like the president. He is totally unique. He's absolutely amazing. But what is also clear is that there is no one like his White House staff. And it's not surprising, is it? When you think about the presidency of the United States, you think about the, the economy that they're running, uh, the country that they're running, they're going to be great people. They're going to be the best in their field. And we know this recently from our own country, don't we? we we've seen how uh, important backroom staff are. Just think about the lengths that Boris Johnson went to uh, to look after his aide, uh, Dominic Cummings. And that's the way of it, isn't it? That's the way of the world. If you want to be in a position of power and stay in a position of power, then you'll need the best people around you. You'll need the, the smartest, the wisest, the wealthiest. How come then, at the beginning of this story, about the conquest of sin and Satan, Jesus calls these men? Well, the reason is because, is because Mark not only wants us to see that Jesus does not need any help, but rather, and most importantly, that Jesus has come to call the unqualified, the unimportant 
and the unworthy. And this is what Mark is talking about in verse 1 when he says, this is the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This should be no surprise to us because this is the, the story of the Bible, isn't it? Some of you might be familiar with the, the video that uh, you can find on YouTube called The March of the Unqualified. And if you haven't seen it, I, I encourage you to watch it. It should be easy enough to find. But it, it, it tells the story, it reminds us how all the people that God used throughout history were, were unqualified. It reminds us that Abraham was too old, that his wife Sarah was too barren, that Abraham was a drunk, that Moses couldn't speak, and so on and so forth. It goes through everyone. No one is qualified to be a part of God's great kingdom. And Mark's gospel is no different. And it starts in the exact same way. Yes, the Son of God has arrived. And yes, he doesn't need our help. Rather, he has come to call the unqualified into his kingdom. As we begin this passage, I think it's important to say that this is good news. And the reason it is good news, because I don't know about you, but isn't this so often how we feel? Isn't there are times in our life when our, our sin or our guilt become so great that we no longer feel worthy to even call ourselves a Christian? Or our sin and our guilt weighs on us so much that we don't feel like we deserve the love of Jesus Christ? Or maybe even you're looking at yourself and you're thinking about your gifts and abilities or your personality and you wonder, what have I got to offer this great kingdom of Jesus Christ? How could I ever bring him glory? Well, if you've ever felt like that, see for yourselves. The first thing Mark wants us to know about Jesus is that he has come for the unqualified. He comes for, the, he comes for those who the world would never expect him to come for. Whoever you are, I hope you see like, like these men, Jesus, the Son of God, is interested in the ordinary, unqualified people like you and me. Jesus is a Christ who calls, but Jesus is also a Christ who challenges. And that's what we see in our next episode, verses 21 uh, to 28, where we see that Jesus' battleground is unexpected. Jesus' battleground is unexpected. And again, if you look down at those verses 21 to 28, you will see that, that the, the very first place Jesus goes with his disciples is to a synagogue in Capernaum. But rather than go there to gather support, we're going to see that Jesus goes there to challenge those who stand opposed to his authority. Now, we see this challenge on two fronts in these verses. First of all, we see it um, towards the established leadership of Israel. And second of all, we see it towards uh, the demonic. Well, let's begin with Jesus' challenge uh, to the established leadership of Israel. Now, it is not as clear, I admit, in this passage, this theme, as it is elsewhere in Mark. But in these verses, Mark hints at how Jesus has come to challenge their authority. And he does this in this passage by, by repeating Jesus' ability to teach, or highlighting his ability to teach. Have a look with me at verse 22 there in your Bibles. Verse 22, and note the reaction of the crowd. Do you see what it says there? Do you see how they respond? Now, do the same in verse 27. Have a read at verse 27. Do you see how they respond to Jesus? And did you notice the repeated word in those two verses? Did you notice it? It's authority, isn't it? It's authority. It's interesting. Mark doesn't tell us what Jesus said. and Well, we would love to know what Jesus said. But instead, what Mark wants us to see or what he wants to tell us is that what Jesus said or how Jesus said it, he said with much more authority, with much real, much more genuine authority than the established teachers. Like I said, this challenge is not explicit in this verse, but Mark is beginning to outline a theme that is to come. Jesus has come to challenge the established leadership of Israel. The second thing, and, and, and certainly more easily seen, is Jesus' challenge towards the demonic. 
We see this in the middle of our passage, don't we? Verses 23 to 25 describe a a demon-possessed man who happens to be in the synagogue crying out against Jesus. And as he shouts against Jesus, Jesus commands or rebukes the evil spirit to come out of the man, which it does. As well as proving the authority of, of Jesus' words, what's also going on here is a connection between the synagogue and the demonic. This might sound like something strange to say, but I encourage you to read through Mark's gospel and I assure you, you will be surprised at how often Jesus finds conflict in the gospel and how that conflict in the gospel is both against the established leadership of Israel and both with the demonic. Now, let me say, I don't think Mark is calling the synagogue demonic, but I do think that he wants to show us the two fronts on which Jesus has come to fight. And I want us, I think he wants us to see that it, it, they're not, it's not what we'd expect. We would expect the promised king of Israel to go into synagogue and to get the greatest support. But actually, that is the place where his battleground is. It's interesting, isn't it? Again, I think this is unexpected. I think this is, it's unexpected for, for even in our world. When we think about Jesus in this way, it, it's not what we, we, we think about him. It's not what people think when they think about Jesus. If you believe what the, how the BBC presents Jesus, how the BBC presents Christianity, and all you have to do is read the articles that they put on there about Christians, you would think that Jesus never said a bad word about anyone or against anything. But you can see for yourselves, can't you? Jesus came to challenge those who oppose his authority. Again, I think this is really good news. I think it's great to know that we have a king who will not stand for falsehood. And particularly, he will not stand for falsehood among the leaders of his people. I think it's also great to know that in a time when our Christian beliefs are being demonised by those who hold authority over us, that Jesus is the only one who has real authority. I think it's great to know that with every passing day, when it seems like the liberal agenda is growing stronger and stronger, that we have a king who was the second thing he did after he called his disciples, went straight into the lion's den and opposed those who stood against his authority. You see, this is what Jesus came to do. He's not pulling his punches and it's what we need from our king. Jesus is a Christ who calls the unqualified. Jesus is a Christ who challenges those who stand against his authority. But Jesus is also a Christ who cares. And we see this in our third point where we see that Jesus' devotion is unexpected. My boys and girls, I want your help. Uh, I need your help uh, to help me uh, explain or or illustrate this point. Uh, And and what we're going to see is we're going to look at verses uh, 29 to 34. Uh, And from those verses, in a moment or two, we're going to see how Jesus cares for people. But I need your help, like I said. And so I want you to pause the video and I want you to to go uh, uh, around your house, through your house, and find something that you would use to care for someone if they're sick. Okay, so pause the video, go get something that you think, if someone was sick, that you think they could use to help them to get better. You um, go get your stuff and I'll get mine. Okay, on you go. Okay, hope you're, hope you're back. Um, now, obviously, I can't see you. I can't see um, what you went to get. Um, but perhaps your parent or guardian could take a picture of you um, with whatever it is you have and you can send me a picture, send that to me on my phone, my number's on the church website. Um, And if you do that, maybe next week I'll give you a shout out. Um, It'd be great, it'd be great to to see what you've got. Um, But let me show you what I've got, okay? Now, I have got lots of things, all right? Let me see, they're all down here. So give me a wee second. What have we got, what have we got? Okay, we'll start with this, will we? Now, we've got, can you see what this is? It's a wee bit bright here. It is, Orange juice, yeah. And I've got some 
delicious grapes tea. I don't know if you've ever felt unwell and you know that orange juice is full of vitamin C and if you have a sore throat and you want something to eat, grapes are absolutely delicious to help us pick us up, make us feel better. And maybe, um, maybe those would be something that you might use as someone who's feeling unwell. What else have I got? Shall we see? What else have I got? Do you know what this is? Can you see it? It's my pillow. Lovely, comfortable pillow. Of course, with pillow, you need a blanket, don't you? And you might just tuck somebody in and make them feel all lovely and comfortable and nice and warm. You might want to give someone rest, help them get a good night's sleep, help them feel all well and cosy inside. Let's see, what else have I got? Now let me see what I've got here. Uh, I don't know if you can see these. Some plasters and of course some medicine. You've got these medicine, I'm not going to open it here. And you've got a spoon and you might, somebody's got a, somebody not feeling terribly well, you might think to yourself, here you are, have a bandage. You might think, here, have some medicine. It'll make you feel better. Now, like I said, perhaps you have one of those things and if you do or if you've got something else I'd love to see it. I'm really keen uh, to see what you've got. Um, but boys and girls I, I want you to see that although I have lots and lots of things here, I have lots of things and there's lots of things that we could use to help people feel better. The point I want us to see is that me with these things there is only so much I could do. There's only so much I could do to make someone feel better or to make them be better. And even if I were a doctor or a nurse, there's only so much I could do to help someone who is sick. Well, with that in mind, I invite you, all of us, to pause the video again and to read verses 29 to 34 and to see what Jesus does. Can you do that for me? Can you pause the video and can you read verses 29 to 34? and see what Jesus does. Okay, hopefully you've done that. Now hopefully you noticed just how remarkable Jesus is. Let's think about this, okay? What's just happened? Jesus has just spent the day in the synagogue teaching and immediately, do you see the word immediately? Immediately the passage says, he goes into Simon's mother-in-law's house and, and heals her. Did you notice how he heals her? Verse 31, it tells us, doesn't it? Jesus just doesn't give her orange juice or, or a pillow or even some medicine. No, Jesus lifted her up and he heals her so completely and so immediately that she's able to serve them. Do you see that? I don't know about you when you, you were last sick, boys and girls, but it normally takes a few days, doesn't it, for us to get better, even with the best care in the world. But Jesus, he can heal people immediately. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? What else? What, what does it tell us after that? Did you notice how many other people Jesus healed that day? It tells us, doesn't it? Verse 32, all who were sick or oppressed by demons. Verse 33, look how many people, the whole city was gathered together. And verse 34, he healed many who were sick. You see, boys and girls, there's only so much I could do. There's only so much a doctor or a nurse could do. But it seems like there is no limit to what Jesus can do. This is unexpected, isn't it? It is unusual, how strange, how amazing. Jesus, Jesus' devotion is extraordinary. It's not normal. And if we were seeing this for the first time, we know Jesus is a caring person, but if we were seeing this for the first time, I think we would struggle to believe what we're reading. Because what's our experience? What's our experience of even the nicest, best leader that we know? They might go into someone's house and they might help them, uh, you know, it's particularly if there's a photo op, they might do that. But eventually their entourage would come and they would take them away and they would make sure that they get rest so they can go out on the campaign trail the next day. But not Jesus. Not the Son of God. Again, it's important, isn't it, that we see this alongside our last point. Because although Jesus came to challenge, he also came to care. His teaching was strong. It had authority. 
but so too was his devotion to his people. It almost was without limit. And again, this is good news, isn't it? Isn't it? It's good news to think, boys and girls, and all of us, because there are times when we think Jesus' devotion towards us might wane. You know, you've fallen into sin for the umpteenth time, and you just think to yourself, surely now, surely now, I cannot go back to Jesus anymore. I'm a hypocrite if I go to church anymore. How can he care for me? How can he still love me? Jesus' energy and desire to care for you will never end. This, of course, is a hint of just how extraordinary his care for his people is, and we know how that's fulfilled on the cross. But Jesus is like none other. His devotion is so unexpected. It is never what we'd expect from a leader. It is extraordinary. Let's move on to our final point, shall we? That Christ, our Christ, uh, Jesus is a Christ who calls, he's a Christ who challenges, he's a Christ who cares, but he is also a Christ with clarity. And we look at this in our final wee passage there, verses 35 to 39, where we see that Jesus' response is unexpected. And then to help us with this, we, we first of all need to notice how in the space of, of, of 20 or so verses, in the verses that we've been studying this morning, how Jesus has become a very popular man. Look with me, for instance, at verse, eight, or verse 28. Do you see what it says in verse 28? At once, his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Verse 33, we've just read it. The whole city was gathered at his door. And here in our passage, verse 36, what does Simon say? Everyone is looking for you. It's clear, isn't it? It's clear. Mark makes it very clear for us that Jesus already has quite a following. Yet this is where the surprise in our passage comes. Because in response to his popularity, Jesus does the unexpected. Just remind ourselves or what our verses say. Let's read them again, shall we? Verses 35. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus departed and went to a place a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Did you see the unexpected response? It was twofold, wasn't it? Look again. Look again if you didn't see it. Do you see what he does in verse 35? He leaves the crowd to be on his own. And then secondly, verse 37. Even when Simon and the disciples come and say, please come back to the crowd. He says, we must move on from this place. This is the surprise in this passage. What do we know about this gospel? According to Mark, the promised king, the son of God has arrived and it looks like a success. It looks like it's going really well. Yet for some reason, here we are in the 35th verse of the first chapter. And Jesus wants to move away from those who want to follow him. I don't know about you, but this prompts a question in my mind. And that question is, what is Jesus doing well, the answer is that he's, is, the answer cannot be that he's overwhelmed. And we know that from what we've just read in the previous verses. It must be something else. Well, Mark makes it clear for us, doesn't he? Verse 39, do you see what he says? He says, and Jesus went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Hope you noticed how what Mark says in that verse matches what I said last week about Jesus' mission. You see, this is what Jesus is here for. He's here to preach, repent and believe. And he is here to challenge and to, de to defeat evil. And Jesus is not going to be distracted by or blinded by fame or by crowds. How unexpected is that? That he's just won the favour of the masses. Yet he remains crystal clear in his purpose. Again, one last time, let's compare that to the leaders of today. I don't know if you've 
ever seen a politician on a campaign trail or have them come to your door. But how often do they promise the world, but whenever they gain your support and they win the election, they get into their position of power, that they don't deliver, that they just rest on their morals, whatever it is they, they do, they, they go no further. Well, here we are, Jesus Christ. He is no ordinary king, a king who will not be distracted, a king who will not fall for the clamour of this world, a king who will not play to the crowd or seek to entertain them or please them, and a king who above all, temptation, opposition, whatever it is, is clear on his mission. And as Mark tells us that he is the king who is going to deliver us from evil and save us from our sins, it is good to see that right at the very beginning, act one of this gospel, that Jesus, even though it seems that he is remarkably successful, is clear on his purpose and will fulfill it. Again, isn't that great news for us? Isn't it great news for us, for the people who are just constantly unfaithful to God? We're so unfaithful. If it depended upon us, if it tended, depended upon our worthiness, our works, our ability to love God, well, we'd be nowhere, wouldn't we? But we have a king. We have a king who is unwavering in his task to deliver God's people from the punishment their sins deserve. And whenever we repent and believe in him, we can be absolutely assured of that. Let me conclude because we have we must draw this to a close because we, we've seen a lot, haven't we? We've seen a lot in this week's sermon. And we're going to be looking at a lot fewer verses next week, let me assure you. But this is the first act of Mark's gospel. And it's jam-packed and it's immediately, immediately, immediately. And it's hard to keep up with all the action. But we have front row seats. And we are able to see every detail. And with our unrestricted view, I hope you have noticed, as we have shown you, that Jesus is no ordinary Christ. He's no ordinary man. And the way he behaves is quite unexpected. Those who he calls are not who we expect. His battleground is not where we expect it to be. His care is unlimited. And his clarity is crystal it is strong and true. As we conclude our time in God's word, as we walk away from our vantage point, consider him. See that he is who Mark says he is. Believe that he has come to fulfill what Mark says he will fulfill. This is Jesus Christ and he is the son of God. Amen. Well, we thank God for his word. And as we move into the third part of our service of worship, we're going to respond to his word. And let us respond to what he has said to us by coming before him in prayer. So let's bow our heads and let's pray. Jesus, we praise you this day for you are a king who calls. You are a king who challenges. You are a king who cares. And you're a king who has clarity. We thank you, King Jesus, as we come into your presence and as we respond to what you have said to us, because it gives us confidence. It gives us confidence to speak to you, to know you more, to know that you will not only hear our prayers, but that you will answer them according to your good and gracious nature. Almighty God, as we think about your word and what we have learned this morning, we, we turn our, our, our prayers, uh, turn our attention to, to others and we pray for them. And we think, first of all, of what we have been learning about Jesus' care for his people. And we know at this time, we know it, that there are people who are afraid and unsure, people who are grieving and anxious. But it's so good to be reminded that you are a God whose care is unlimited. Almighty God, as we think about this care, we, we're reminded or we're caused to think about this possibility that, that we are 
we might be able to, to gather together to come into your presence on a Sunday morning and worship. And we know that this is what we're created for. And we know that what we're doing here, although we're able to worship in our homes, is, is not what you have decreed in your word. And almighty God, we, we even have a sense that what we are doing here is part of your judgment upon your people. Almighty God, we're, we are working these things out and we are trying to discern what is going on in the world at the minute. But as we do that, we pray that you would keep our minds fixed upon your son. A son who not only challenges those who oppose his, te his teaching and authority, but your son who cares for his people. We know that worship is where you primarily pastor your people. Corporate worship is where your care prim primarily takes place. And so we pray that you would guide us, guide us back. Guide us back to a time whenever we may meet together in our meeting house. We pray for wisdom in that. We pray that you would look after us in that, that you would guide the task group. And you would give us a confidence that whenever we return, we are doing in accordance not only to the law and the will of the land, but the law and the will of God. Jesus, we think also of about we think also about how those who you call are not who the world might expect. And so we pray in response to your word for those that we know who need to hear your call. We pray that your spirit would show them their unworthiness so that those who, who feel unworthy are worthy to be Christians, we pray that you would show them their unworthiness, show them that they are indeed sinful people. And we pray that your spirit would make them be a repentant people, that he would give them the faith that they need to believe in you and receive all the blessings, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. We pray too for those who, whose lives are the opposite, who are actually burdened with a sense of inadequacy. We pray that they would know that the kingdom of God is made up of unimportant, unworthy, and unqualified people. We pray that you would use us to answer this prayer. We have been blessed to study your word this morning and we pray that, that you would equip us with this word. Help us use it, go into the lives of these people, help us speak to these people, help us open up, mark one with them and show them that Jesus came to deliver them from their sins and into their, his glorious kingdom. Finally, Jesus, we pray thanks for your clarity. And we think about that, we think about your great plan to return and to redeem this world forever. Because as we look around our world, we see that it is still broken, that it needs redeemed, that it needs a saviour. And we think in particular about the plague of locusts that has hit East Africa. It's hard for us to imagine how devastating that is. But it is devastating. And it is particularly hard for those people in the midst of COVID-19 to deal with this this plague too. We know that there are many more stories of hardship and brokenness throughout this world. But we praise you that you are crystal clear on your purpose. And we know that nothing is going to deter you from returning and destroying evil forever and bringing your people into your kingdom. Whereby everything, every part of this world will be redeemed and recreated and last forever without plague or illness or death or sin. In the meantime, Jesus, we pray that your people would have that hope. They would be assured of that. And that we would give it to those who, who need it around us. And each, as each of us witness things in this world being destroyed, being decayed by sin. That we would turn to your son, Jesus Christ. See his clarity and be assured that he will fulfill his mission. He is coming back. And he will bring us into his everlasting kingdom. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your son, Jesus Christ. We praise you that he is the son of God, the king, the Christ, who, who, who does all of these things. And we commit these things to you in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, let us conclude our service of worship by singing uh, together uh, one more time. And let us, as musicians, commence. Sing the words of the hymn.
beneath the cross of Jesus. As we conclude worshipping uh, in our homes, let us leave uh, God's presence with his blessing. Receive the blessing of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you all. Amen.